Hi, I'm Dr. Hackey Reitman. Welcome to another episode of Exploring Different Brains. And now we're going to have another visit with the expert in traumatic brain, David A. Grant, up there in New Hampshire, the founder of TBI Hope Magazine, and so many other things, author, advocate, and leader, and himself a traumatic brain injury survivor. David, welcome to Different Brains. Good, uh, good day, Hacky. It's nice to be here with you again. I like to play a little game here at Different Brains, which is my contention is that, first of all, I like to look for tools that can really help. Mm -hmm. All the science is great to help produce and learn things, but I'm into like simple tools we can use. That's why I wrote the book Asper Tools, which pertain to the practical guide to understanding Asperger's autism and neurodiversity. Because by the time I finished the book, I knew it was about all these different entities that somehow ended up in different silos. Traumatic brain was over here and autism was over here and Alzheimer's was over there and PTSD was up here. And now, wait a minute, a lot of these tools will help all of these different mm -hmm. entities. So now let's hear from one of the world's experts internationally in traumatic brain, you, David A. Grant, what are some of the tools that some of our audience here at Different Brains can use for their brain that you have found helpful for your brain? What, one of the things that I, that, I, that I bring to the brain injury community is an insider's voice. Um, I'm a lay person that has had um, an immense range of experiences. So we'll leave, the, we'll leave the moniker of experts for those that have a lot of initials after their name. But there are some things that, that have helped me immensely. Um, and they actually transcend a lot of different neuro conditions and dovetail very well for the uh, neurodiverse community. Uh, the first piece that was a game changer, and it's funny, but it's one that I um, advocate very highly for is a support group. I am a huge believer in peer to peer support. Um, it's hard, you know, for the first couple of months, I was totally alone in brain injury. And it's hard to say I'm unique when I'm sitting in a room full of 30 of my peers that all experience similar things. And within the peer-to-peer -peer support group um, environment, you're able to be in the association of those who have similar challenges. Although there is a saying, if you've seen one brain injury, you've seen one brain injury, but there are some common threads to a lot of what we, we deal with, memory loss, speech loss, um, loss of emo emotional filters. Um, uh, you know, the first year I would say just about anything to anyone, and that's a story unto itself. Uh, so that, that, that association with um, peers has been uh, just a game changer for me. Um, I walked into my first local brain injury support group in April of 2011, it was put on by the um, um, New Hampshire Brain Injury Association. I now co-facilitate that group, and I'm fortunate in that I'm a board member for the Brain Injury Association of New Hampshire. And I walked in there and thought, I didn't actually, I don't know what I thought. I thought I was in the wrong room um, because the people there looked like me. I didn't really have any expectations. And one of the gentlemen there said, if you're looking for people that have trouble up here, you found the right place. So piece number one is um, um, peer support. And it's not just we can cry on each other's shoulders. In our, in our regular group meetings, um, there are shared compensatory strategies, shared solutions, um, fellowship, companionship. Um, the, the, the benefits abound. And the other piece that I realize is that not everybody watching will have access to a support group. Um, over the last couple of years. And part of what's driven our advocacy work is that larger underserved group of people um, who might live in, you know, East Nowhere, Idaho, uh, uh, where the nearest support group may be 100 miles away. There are internet resources that, though not the same as being in a face-to-face -face group, uh, can be helpful. So support groups, number one. Uh, the other piece is don't believe everything you're told. Um, and no disrespect to the uh, medical community, but there's a lot of misinformation out there. Well, they don't get and training, my, by the way. They, pardon me? They don't get training. 
yeah. shockingly. But uh, it's not their fault. They don't. And it has to be changed. But uh, keep going. Yeah, things are changing, though. Um, yep. The last four or five years, brain injury has uh, kind of come out of the closet. And it's joined, it's part of the national narrative, and uh, it's not as uh, alien a concept as it used to be. Um, I was told by a respected neuropsychologist at a little over a year out, um, basically, that my life was over. Um, I went through extensive neuropsych testing. I scored in the bottom 5% for verbal recall and complex problem solving. And he strongly suggested that I get a handicap placard for my car. He said, you're better off not trying anything new because you'll be befuddled, confused, and disappointed. And then he said, I can, I can write up the report totally accurately in a way that will allow you to collect Social Security. And my wife and I walked out of that meeting devastated. And we're, we tend to, we, we're, we're rule breakers, but in a good way. So when he said, don't try anything new, we sat down a month or so later, took a one-year calendar and wrote one thing new a month that we'd never done. <laughs> and for that year, we went out to try a new experience. So the other piece is, you know, just because you hear it doesn't necessarily mean it's true. Uh, another one to add to the list is surround yourself as exclusively as you can with people who have your back and your best interests at heart. Um, a synonym it, for that, a synonym for that is people who are positive, positive people, not negative people. Positive. Yeah, that. Oh. Yeah, your thoughts define your actions and your, your thoughts define your environment. So um, that's another piece that, that's helped quite a bit. And the other one that I'm really keen on is serving others. You know, think about for a minute, think about what the world would look like. And I know your backstory, you know, you discovered that your daughter had Asperger's and now you serve that community and a greater good. So you've taken something that's crossed your path. And you said, you know what, I've got some unique experience here that I can offer that will help others. And you didn't just think about it, you know, differentbrains.com and a lot of what you've done is you saying, I've got some solutions that I'm willing to share. And as I look around the landscape of my life, the people who seem to have more life stability post trauma and post TBI are those that have adopted a life where they give back. And rest assured, no matter what somebody's current condition is, everybody has something to offer. And it's like a friend of mine says, I can't be worrying about my stuff if I'm trying to help you with yours. So finding a way to give back is just um, in the, um, you know, in the, Saint, the prayer of St. Francis, it's in giving that we receive. And when you give back, although you do it without expectations, uh, blessings tend to come your way. The other piece is... Um, um, Time is, I initially hated time. Um, you know, every day was painful. The first year, uh, there were daily thoughts of suicide. Uh, I tried to find a way to make that fit in a way that my wife could collect my, uh, my hefty health, uh, life insurance premium. Um, it was just torturous. And um, uh, I, would, I would explain my frustration to TBI old timers and folks would say, you know, you got to be easy on yourself. Time is your friend and it will get better. And it, being an instant gratification guy, my question is when? And I take a look now, I'm now in year seven and it got better. And I think a lot of, for anybody new to the TBI journey, what I would suggest is, you know, a lot of it's just grunt work and busy work. And when you stay busy during the first year or two, and it may sound like a really long time, but you're allowing your brain to heal. And you just nothing, take, you can't accelerate that process. So I've learned that time is my friend. And even today, when I'm in the presence of uh, folks that have been doing this a lot longer than I have, um, I'll ask, do you still see measurable gains? And 100% of the time, the answer is yes. And what I, what I use that for, Hacky, is I look at the future and go, I'm not that suicidal lost soul that I was in 2011. I've emerged with a new sense of purpose. And if you kind of extrapolate that logically, in two, three, four, ten 10 years from now, the David who is won't be the David who is today. So, like, how can you not have hope, you know? Uh, how has this affected your spirituality? Wow. You know, over the years, nobody has asked me that. Um, I've come away from the experience with a very deep conviction. My, my background before my accident, I, I, I ran my own um, 
business. I was a marketing professional. I developed marketing assets and marketing collateral for clients in the business space. Um, I developed uh, organizational brands. I worked on social strategies, um, very much a geek. And there are times that I've never really articulated this uh, to anyone. There are times I feel like I may have been, um, and I don't like to use, I don't want to make it lofty, but I feel like I might have been chosen by whatever you call it, the power of the universe, God, a higher power, the spirit of the universe. Somewhere, somebody said, he's got a type of skill set that ultimately, when he comes out the other side, can be used by that power to serve others. So what it's done is... Um, a couple of things. Um, I believe that I was supposed to take the hit that day. It's been tough on everyone, but I do believe that my um, I'm realizing my fate and living the life that I was destined to live. Uh, many years ago, when I was kind of complaining to my wife, she said to me candidly, we weren't serving any, we're honorable people, you know, good morals, good values, you're raising kids. But she said, we weren't serving anyone before your accident. So that blessing has come out of all of this. And the other thing, oddly enough, is it's taken away my fear of death. Um, you know, I, 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 um, the day that I was on Main Street, um, I'm laying there and my body is broken. I can barely move. I had just regained consciousness. And I looked down to my feet and there was a passerby that had their hand. I can't even tell you the gender, whether it was a man or a woman that had their hand over their mouth with tears streaming down their face. And I thought, oh, shit, I may die today. I, this may be it. And I did a mental inventory and I said, OK, the last words to my wife were, I love you. My kids were mostly grown and uh, taken care of. Um, and I had an odd sense of if this is my time, like it's OK, like I've lived a good life, never even having, you know, how would I know what was to come to pass because of this? And um, I no longer fear death. Why? Uh, I, it's almost like I've stared death in the eye and it, there's never victory because the same fate awaits us all. But, um, you know, I've looked at my own mortality and reflected on my own life. And I even at that point, I was happy with the life that I lived. Today, I'm, uh, I'm over the moon happy with the life that we've been blessed to live. Has your relationship with your whole family improved been the same or what what advice would you give sounds like you have an amazing wife sarah but you know what <sighs> what advice can you give these families out there um personality changes are very common uh, within those that experience brain injury um very and yeah you know, I'm, I'm quicker to hug but i'm quicker to tell you how i really think about things because it's some of the frontal lobe damage and the the, the loss of the emotional filter and in my own realm, you unknowingly hit on one of the most bittersweet parts of the journey. Um, I started writing my first book in 2011, although I didn't know I was writing a book. I started journaling as things were happening. And at one point I went, wow, this is this could be a book. Metamorphosis, Surviving Brain Injury was released in early 2012. My mom, uh, I held off for three or four months uh, in letting my folks read it. One of the chapters in my book is titled, I Lied. And in, in it, I talk in very um, candid detail about lying to those close to me because I did not want them to be burdened by the pain that I was carrying on the inside. My mom later said, I read a couple of pages. I cried for a couple of days. I read a couple of pages. I cried for a few more days. Uh, my dad read it all in one sitting. It's an, it's an easy read. And uh, my mom said he got really quiet for about a week. And my mom and dad and I are closer than we have ever been. Um, they have accepted their new son. I'm not the same person that they raised, but they love me unconditionally. Things were hard for my wife and I for a couple of years. Uh, she has openly said, he is not the same man I married. We had 18 years of history as a monogamous couple before um, my accident. And she has openly and publicly said, if we did not have that type of foundation, she, our marriage would not have survived the injury. She's um, moved forward in a career of service as somebody helping caregivers. So she's found her way to give back. She um, founded and facilitates one of the world's largest online caregiver support groups. So she's we're, we're kind of together as partners in all of this. 
where it gets hard is when I when I go downstream. Um, I have four sons, and it's very common within the um, TBI community for folks to think that whoever is the uh, the survivor may be either embellishing or faking some of the challenges. I wrote a piece about it a few years ago called "Are You a TBI Fake?" And a few years ago, uh, uh, vicious rumor started that I was um, faking my challenges because I wanted attention. And it happened, it, it's kind of tragic because it happened early on when I was least able to self-advocate and say, look, these are the things that are, that are going on. And the net net on that is um, at one point, all four of my sons walked out of my life and decided to drink the Kool-Aid and agree that dad was faking this brain injury stuff. Uh, hacky, it was, and this happened in conjunction with that just abysmal first year, loss of career, loss of self loss of self-worth, children leaving. And again, it was just that the, it was pouring down like, like a black rain. Um, my youngest son, who I've always been closer to, um, at one point actually said to me, uh, Dad, why don't you just admit it and we can all move on? And I can't, I don't lie. Lying is not right. And uh, he ended up moving back at one point from his mom's house back into our home as a teenager. And once he lived with me for about a month and he would hear me ask him the same question and then ask him again and ask him again, or a lot of the other challenges or hear my speech challenges, he came to the realization that dad really does have challenges. He and I are now closer than we have ever been. My um, oldest son, I haven't had a word with since 2011. Uh, now you see him, now you don't. He walked out of a family cookout and never looked back, and uh, he's made the decision to fade to black in my life. You know, I, I cried a couple of years uh, worth of rivers of tears, and uh, the outreach became a little less and less. Um, you know, from calling a few times a week to, you know, once a week to once a month to texting. You know, let's just talk. And you know, he got married a couple of years ago. The internet showed me his wedding pictures, and uh, so there's been no reconciliation there. Where there's life, there's hope. So I hold out hope. And um, my second son did the same thing. Um, he jumped very briefly back into my life for a cameo. And other than a few weeks, he's been gone for over five years. My third son, and again, it, we talked about it earlier in a, in a couple of times. What are you going to focus on? It's tragic. And frankly, it sucks. And I, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about, you know, how are you guys doing? You know, how's your, how are your lives? How are you doing professionally? Um, um, I'd love to meet your wife, you know, things that I are, are just, tra you can't candy coat or put a positive spin on it. The best that I can do is coexist with it. My, uh, my third son was gone for a while and uh, my wife and I, um, a little over a year ago, we're going out to um, North Dakota and I was in a, you travel, I was in an airport and uh, I saw a, a call from my son and I thought, oh my goodness, He's calling me and like, how can you not be excited? You know, I thought maybe the, the end is over and um, I picked it up and I lost him. So I texted him and I'm like, you know, you might have butt dialed me, but I hope things are good. And he fired back an immediate reply. You and I need to talk. Now, this is just like, remember the old OJ Simpson commercials when he's running through the airport, jumping over yeah, the barriers right. to get on a plane. They were, you know, now now seating boarding group B. So we had to get on the plane. So I said, you know, uh, uh, we had a layover in Minneapolis. I said, you know, I'll get back to you when we're in Minneapolis. And we only had a couple of minutes between uh, flights. And as they were boarding, I called him. What happened? And um, he said, uh, Dad, we need we need to talk. And I said, my first thing, Perrette, you're, you're Dad. Are you okay? Yes, I'm okay, but I want to share some news with you. Um, my daughter was born last month. I'm now a dad, and you're now a grandfather, and we need to we need reconciliation. Wow. And. Um, he, and uh, we, we got on the plane and I sat again on a day I will never forget. I forget a lot, but I won't forget that day. And I joke about it when I speak periodically, when they say, please put your phones to airplane mode. Uh, I'm going to ask for forgiveness in advance for anybody who may be watching this within the, the FAA family. I ignored it. And for the next uh, six or seven minutes as we taxi, he's firing me picture after picture after picture of my brand new, our brand new granddaughter. And um, we got back after a couple of days, met him the uh, following week. And uh, to fast forward to today, uh, Amelia is at our home every Tuesday. We're part of her immediate circle of care. Um, I've gone from being David to being grandpa. 
and uh, and I choose you know, again. What are you going to focus on? You know, am I going to focus on the fact that I'm going to be forever challenged, or that a meaningful life is possible? Am I going to focus on the fact that you know the relationships with my sons may or may not come back, or do I focus on the fact that I've got this amazing human life that I, I will be the only grandpa she knows? She'll never say, "Remember when we had old grandpa and new grandpa?" Like I'm it. So. You know, to add some closure to that, you know, it's complicated. Most relationships um, are more meaningful than they've ever been. There's uh, an amazing resource out there that I'll point out to anybody in the brain injury community. It's called the TBI Guide by a doctor named Dr. Glenn Johnson. And it is the definitive guide for life after brain injury. My wife and I were fortunate in that we found this reasonably soon after my injury. And it was the... um, uh, the first piece of literature where he openly said, I have never seen an individual come back to 100% after a brain injury, to which we replied, well, we'll get as close as we can. But he talks about dynamics, and he said most brain injury survivors lose 80% of their friends in the first year, which was our case. People that were close to socially knew that I was different, and human nature is what it is. When things are different, you back away that, from that which you don't understand. But the book goes on to say, don't worry, because the void that was left with those that have left your life will soon become filled with others. And I look at um, people who are part of my inner circle now, and they are the most cherished relationships I've ever had. They're more meaningful. They're not superficial. And if I sense superficiality, I mentioned in one of my, my points earlier about surround people with those that have your best interests in heart. If it's superficial, um, I, you know, life is fast. It goes by quickly. And I choose to spend time with those that I cherish. Um, complicated, not an easy answer. Uh, complicated stuff. Um, but it's common. You know, I'm not unique in this. I tell you, it's a great answer. And it's a great, it's a great positive thought complex that has a lot of moving parts. Um, mm. How can our audience who are probably as enthralled as I've been listening to all this and watching all this. And by the way, we make it accessible as an audio cast, as a video cast, a video cast with uh, with, uh, um, captions, a transcript. However your brain takes it in, we'll get it to you. But uh, how can people find out more about you? The easiest way, Hacky, is to just go to tbihopeandinspiration.com. From there, we've got links to our social community, uh, to our YouTube channel, to Twitter, um, to my blog. I blog regularly about day-to-day life with uh, with a brain injury. So we'll keep it simple, tbihopeandinspiration.com. And I've got to do it. One last plug for the magazine. Um, You can sign up right on the main page. And my wife and I are committed to making sure that this um, ad infinitum remains a um, free resource for folks. We will always keep the digital version available for free. And it's not a watered down version. The same content that's in the print version is in the digital version. So it's not a case of, you know, get the free version that's not as uh, content rich. Sure. And the print version is available on amazon.com. And if you just uh, use TBI Hope Magazine, you'll find uh, the current and archived issues. Well, David A. Grant, it's been a pleasure visiting you yet again here for another episode of Exploring Different Brains. Keep being the champion you are of all of those who have traumatic brain injury and those of us whose brains are a little bit different in other ways too. Thanks a lot, David. Yeah, thank you, Hacky. It's nice to be with you yet again. We're, we're becoming uh, hard and fast friends. For more information, visit us at differentbrains.com.